you turn with me uh, in the Bible to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, we're working our way through this final chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, and we read together just the opening seven verses again this morning. Philippians chapter 4, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We know God will add his own blessing to the public reading of his precious word. The text this morning is verse 6 of Philippians chapter 1. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. This is perhaps one of the most familiar verses in this entire book. It's one I'm sure that many of us know by heart. We have committed it to memory, and rightly so, for it is a very, very important verse for us as the people of God. The verse that prohibits the indulgence of anxious thoughts and also gives to us the antidote and the answer to that spirit of anxiety that so often grips us. It's interesting that the King James Bible translates it to be careful for nothing. And in the ESV it is do not be anxious about anything. Is there a contradiction here? No, not really. Because back in the time when the King James Bible was translated, the word careful had a kind of a different meaning from the modern meaning that we give it today. If we tell our kids, for example, to be careful we are basically telling them to be, to be diligent, not to be careless, but to be diligent. But the word careful back then literally meant to be full of care. And hence the ESV is, is right when it translates the word as anxious. Do not be anxious about anything. The English word anxious comes from a Latin word, angere which literally means to choke. And of course we can begin to understand that anxiety is something that chokes out our joy and chokes out our peace. For anxiety can be defined as trouble of mind or disquietude of spirit or uneasiness or apprehensiveness or nervousness. And so the Bible forbids us as God's people to be anxious and to be not to be anxious and not to be anxious about anything. Sometimes when a pastor preaches on a particular subject, he's aware of the fact that perhaps to some in the congregation that subject is not really relevant. But we can't say that about this subject. This is something that is relevant to us all because all of us have, or perhaps some of us are, or certainly, or certainly all of us will, experience at some time this thing that we call anxiety. We will experience it at some time, and we will experience it to some degree. It may be a very low-level background disturbance of the mind, or it may be something which has gone into an extreme form, which even today mental health professionals 
are saying is increasing more and more amongst us. We go on to your uh, Google or Yahoo or whatever it is that you use as your search engine on your computer and look up the word anxiety or anxiety state. And you'll find that medical professionals and mental health professionals are telling us that we are living at a time and in a culture when anxiety, and particularly severe anxiety, is on the increase. We have conditions known as general anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder or social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a whole range of other phobias or fears that have become the province of the mental health community to treat and to counsel. Anxiety is a real problem and as I've already said it has come to us or it will come to us in some degree at some time. The subject is therefore relevant but the subject is more than that it's important because when you think of this matter of anxiety or worry if you like or apprehensiveness or uneasiness or trouble of mind you'll find this is a subject that is addressed in many many parts of the scriptures it's even addressed in the Old Testament scriptures. You think of the Psalms, where the psalmist asks himself the question, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? That turmoil of soul is anxiety. It is something that was addressed by the Lord Jesus Christ, specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells us not to take any anxious thought about the morrow. And again he reasons and he remonstrates with those who were listening to him about this plague of the mind that we call anxiety. And every time that you find it mentioned in scripture, whether in the Old Testament, in the words of the Saviour, or in the inspired words of his apostles, you'll find that this is something that is clearly, repeatedly forbidden to us by God. We have it straight and clear here. Do not be anxious about anything. Its importance is seen in the fact that we look at the general overall theme of this particular epistle, and as we've already said and noted on very many occasions, the, the general theme is that of joy. Paul wants the believers to experience and that continually the joy of the Lord and to experience it in an increasing measure. Anxiety is the great enemy of that joy. I don't know that if you could truly be anxious and joyful at one and the same time. It's important not only when we consider the theme of the epistle, but it's important when we regard the fact that this is a great test of the quality and degree of our faith. How we respond to the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations of life, evidences the quality and the degree of our faith. It's very easy for us as the people of God to profess our confidence in the Lord and our confidence in the promises of the Lord and in the presence of the Lord with us. It's easy to make that profession when things are going well. But let trouble come, and it will come because we do live in a broken world. And it will come in, in various in various forms, it will come at various times, it will come to different degrees, and it is at that time that our faith is truly proven and really tested. Think of the occasion when the disciples of the Saviour were told by him to go across the Lake of Galilee in the boat, and the storm arose. And you remember that the disciples were terrified. They thought they were going to perish. In fact, they came to the sleeping Lord and they said, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? And you know the rest of the story of how that the Lord stood up and rebuked the winds and the waves and there was a great calm. And then the Lord asked them this question, where is your faith? The reality and quality of faith will be demonstrated and we are coming through times that are troublesome and difficult. So it's important for that reason also, not only because it's the theme of the epistle, not only because of the, this is a great test of our faith, 
but because also this whole matter affects our testimony before the world. We have looked at this on a number of occasions when Paul is desirous for the joy of the believers not only for their sakes and not only for the Lord's sake but also for the sake of the world that is looking on. We remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, that the world is watching us. And not only is it watching us, but it's watching us with a critical eye. And it's looking for the inconsistencies between what we profess to believe and how we actually behave. What message does it give to the world when, going through the same trials and tribulations as they do, we have no different reaction to that which they have? That we are just as anxious, just as worried, just as fearful, just as panicked as they are. Is, that a, is this a testimony to the truth and to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Rather, it is a tremendous testimony when believers are going through severe trials, that they can face those trials and that they can demonstrate in the midst of those trials a spirit that is... I use the word deliberately, not natural, but supernatural. Very different from that which ordinarily would be the case. I was reflecting on the great testimony that struck the heart of John Wesley when he and his brother were heading to the North American colonies to be missionaries and they ran into a severe storm. There was on board the ship a group of Moravians from Germany. And during the storm, they were conducting a religious service, which they continued to engage in, even as the storm raged. It says that the English passengers were screaming with fear. Wesley was absolutely terrified because of the storm. But as he looked at the Moravians, there was a perfect calmness. And such was that calmness that administered to him that these people had something which he did not yet possess. That in the midst of a terrifying situation, their hearts were completely at peace. This is therefore a, an important subject for all of those reasons. And the Lord says to us, do not be anxious about anything. And that teaches us very simply, first of all, that the Lord is, is cognizant. He is aware of our proneness to be anxious. The Lord looks down upon us and he understands us. One of the great things about our Lord is that he knows our frame, to use the words of the psalmist, and he remembers that we are but dust. He understands all of our natural inclinations. He understands the things that would cause us to be anxious. He is cognizant of the fact that we are very prone to this matter of anxiety. But not only is the Lord cognizant of our proneness to it, the Lord cares about us in it. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, the Apostle Peter is, is led to again give counsel on this very subject when he tells the believers who were scattered abroad, many of them because of the most bitter and violent persecution at the time, he tells them this, he says, cast all of your cares upon him. Cast all of your anxieties upon the Lord, your God and your Savior. Why? For he cares for you. So the Lord is not only cognizant of our anxieties, he's, he cares about it and he cares about us in the midst of it, the burdens that we carry that arouse worry and concern and fear and turmoil in our minds and hearts. But the Lord does more than that. He not only understands and he not only cares, but the Lord wants us to know this, brothers and sisters, that the Lord can conquer anxiety in our hearts. He makes it clear here. And we will look at the verse in detail, not so much this morning, but next Lord's Day, if the Lord spares us. 
He makes it clear here and he makes it clear elsewhere in Scripture. And I think of the Sermon on the Mount again in Matthew chapter 5 and, and in Matthew chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 7 where the subject of the care comes up and worry and fear comes up. The Lord makes it absolutely clear that there is a very real and a very effective antidote to anxiety. The anxieties that rob us of the peace of God and the joy of the Lord. And so that's really what brings us to this text this morning. Be anxious or do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. Before we, we jump into an analysis of the text itself, I want, as it were, just to push the pause button. To stop for a moment and to consider the context in which the, this particular exhortation or injunction of the Lord or command of God is given to us. When you read through this chapter, this fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, I likened it last time that we looked at it to a, a hive of bees. Uh, the Lord tells us that we are to be stable. That we are to, to be agreeable, that we are to be joyful, uh, we are to be reasonable. That was the last B that we looked at. And here's another one, he is to be, be tranquil. Now we might think that Paul is just sort of sitting there in the cell at Rome, either writing himself or dictating his letter to someone else. And, and he's just as it were, sort of thinking or giving scattered thoughts. Now that's, that's not it at all. Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These are not scattered and totally, totally unrelated precepts that the Lord is giving. There is a, a connection between them all. And it, it, it all fits into this overall theme of how we can know and live in a deepening joy in the Lord. And so with that in mind, we look again at the exhortation. Do not be anxious about anything. And we ask ourselves, well, what is the context of this particular injunction? And that refers us back to what has just been said. What immediately precedes this at the end of verse 5? It is this statement, the Lord is at hand. Or, the Lord is near. This statement, the Lord is near, provides a bridge between what Paul has just said and between what he is now saying, what has he just said? Let your reasonableness, and we looked at that last time, which means your graciousness, your forbearance, your gentleness, your patience. Let all of that be known unto all men. Let this be the testimony that you have in all of your relationships, in all of your interactions with other people. Let your, this, this be known that you are a gracious gentle, patient individual. And then, as his argument for being like that, he says, the Lord is near. And we looked at why that, that was significant and why that, that was connected. So it was connected back to that <coughs> exhortation to be reasonable, but it's, a, it's also connected to this one. Don't be anxious. Be tranquil. Be at peace. What's he saying? He's saying very obviously this, because the Lord is near. Because the Lord is near, you do not need to be anxious about anything. If we are going to find victory, brothers and sisters, over the temptation that comes to us all to stress out over adverse events, whether they are real or whether they are imaginary, and many of them are, as we know, then this truth, this simple statement, this reality, this fact that the Lord is near has to be remembered by us and more than that, it has to be rested in by us. And before we even get to what he later on says about making your request be known unto God, there is a connection that we need to start with here. Remember this. Remember that the Lord is near. Rest in the fact that the Lord is near. And when you remember that fact and believe that fact and rest in that fact, 
you will experience what is promised in verse 7. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard, will garrison your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. I think it is vital for us, therefore, to understand the connection in this context. The Lord is near, therefore, do not be anxious about anything. Now why? Why is that truth part of the answer to our proneness to anxiety and worry? Well, let's, let, us, let us start with this very simply and very basically. What is that telling us? The Lord is near. And by, and by that, let us understand it means he is near to us. He is near to us individually and as his people. He's not afar off. He's not a million miles away. He's as close to us as our next breath. That means very simply this, beloved. We're never alone. We're never alone. Facing adversity alone can be terrifying. The fact or the belief that we are alone simply exacerbates and increases the level of anxiety in you. And you maybe have a situation where you, you've been worried about doing something or going somewhere and, and it's really been disturbing you and then some friend comes alongside and says to you, look, I'll go with you and I'll stand beside you and I'll not leave you. Does that fact not immediately bring a lessening of the anxiety, a lessening of the fear? You're never alone. And dear brothers and sisters, this morning, let us understand this very simple fact that I'm sure we would all tick the box if we were asked this morning if we believed that at least intellectually. Do we really realize that we're never alone? Do we never have to face anything alone? The Lord is near. The Lord, David said, you remember in, in, in that wonderful psalm, he says, I have set the Lord always before me. And then he says this, because he is at my right hand, I shall never be moved. And that's not just true for David. That's not just true for people who we would think of as super saints. That's true for the weakest saint. That's true especially for the, the trembling saint of God. That's true for the Mr. Fearful out of the Pilgrim's Progress as well as for Mr. Largeheart. The Lord is at your right hand. You are never, never, never alone. And whatever circumstance you have to face, however fearful it might be to us naturally speaking, let it be the worst fear of all. And what is the greatest fear of all? It is surely the, the fear of death. And yet even in that, and I don't want to run ahead of myself, but even in that the Lord promises us this wonderful reality. We do not face that alone. We have quoted the words of Psalm 23 perhaps so often that the truth of them doesn't really sink down into our souls and strengthen our hearts. But think of the words again, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. David recognized, I'm, I'm not on my own. I can't help but think, and I've said this often, particularly at, at, at conducting a funeral service for a believer. There was a, a certain preacher in Scotland in the last century. One of the most eminent and eloquent preachers, gospel preachers of the time, but he had a particular fear of the dark. He's always afraid of the dark. And he tells the story how that one evening coming home to a, a remote part of Scotland where he lived, he, he had to cross over a bridge and go through a forested area before he arrived home. And the night was dark and the clouds had covered the stars and the moon. And he hesitated at the bridge in the darkness and he knew he had to, to walk through the darkness of the forest and he was afraid. And he says, as I paused there, he says, I listened and I heard a voice. And the voice said, is, is that you, John? 
And instantly I recognized the voice. It was the voice of my father. And he says, come on, son, I knew you'd be afraid. And I'm here to walk with you through the darkness. And he says, I, I lifted my head and put out my chest and I walked into the darkness unafraid because my father was there. And there'll come a time, brothers and sisters, when we'll come to the edge of the river and we'll come to the darkness and we'll hear a voice calling our name and saying, I knew you'd be afraid. I've come to walk with you. We're never alone. He has promised, dear friends, this morning never to leave us or forsake us. There are two well, there are more than two, but there are two very simple and powerful truths in this statement. The Lord is near, which will garrison our courage, will help us to, to gird up the loins of our faith at times when we are tempted to be anxious. Two very simple truths. First of all, we ask ourselves the question, who is near? The Lord is near. You say, well, that, that's obvious. That didn't really require a great deal of, of thought. But I want you to think about this for a little bit this morning because this is, this is vital. This is important if we are going to, to grapple with this monster of anxiety that threatens to overwhelm us at times. Who is this one that Paul is talking about here when he talks about the Lord? Well, you'll find that when you go through the epistle, he's referring to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that should immediately lift our spirit somewhat because the one who is on our right hand and the one who is there that he will never leave us on our own is, is not a mere mortal. And more than that, he's not a weakling. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we thought about this on Resurrection Sunday as we pondered the final words of the Savior before his advent, or his ascension rather, to sit at the Father's right hand. What were among the final words that he gave to his disciples before he left them? He said this, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You see, if you're facing a particular matter that causes a bit of worry or anxiety, and when someone says, look, I'll go with you and I'll stand with you and I'll be with you in this, it will greatly add to your confidence when you know that this one who is with you is one who is in absolute control over everything. And not only does he have having sovereign authority over everything, remember, including the circumstances that are making you anxious, but he has absolute power. And I distinguish the two words, authority and power. Sometimes we... We make, them, we make them almost synonymous, but they're not synonymous. Authority is the right to do something. Power is the ability to do something. Jesus is both. He is not only the authority given to him by the Father over all things, things in heaven and things in earth. We thought last week of those wonderful words in Ephesians. That God had set him on his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Friends, this morning, the one who has all of that authority over all of those things, the good spiritual beings, the angelic hosts of heaven, but he's authority also over the very powers of hell. They are subject to him. They cringe in his presence. This is the one who stands at our right hand. This is the one who says, look, I, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you. But not only does he have that authority, he has absolute power. There is nothing that is going to defeat him. There is nothing that is going to bamboozle him. There is nothing that is going to frustrate him. You remember how he demonstrated that again and again during his earthly ministry. People came to him with questions. Sometimes they were sincere questions, wanting an answer, wanting direction, wanting spiritual light. Sometimes they were questions that were posed by his enemies to try and find fault with him and to trip him up that they might accuse him. But was there any question that ever confused him? Was there ever a time when he was left standing with his mouth open and nothing to say? 
In fact, it tells us about his enemies when they came to question him, that they marveled, they were amazed at his answers. And you come into a situation, dear brother or sister, and you don't know why it's come, and you don't know what you're, what you're going to do about it, and how to respond to it. Listen, the one who's standing as your friend at your right hand is not in the least bit confused. Not in the least. And what is more, he's not in the least bit frustrated by anything. You see the power that he demonstrated in the days of his flesh, power over disease. They brought to him all manner of diseases. You ever read that in scripture? All manner of diseases. Tell me, was there ever one that he couldn't deal with? Was there ever a situation that his disciples found himself in that either surprised him or frustrated him? And no, there was nothing. Disease was subject to his power. Demons were subject to his power. The very elements of this earth, the winds and the waves, were subject to his power. Are we getting this into our souls this morning? This is the one who says, I'll go with you. I'm at your right hand. But, it, but it's even better than that, this one who is with us. He has sovereign authority, he has absolute power, but I'll tell you something more. He has infinite love for you. He has infinite love for you. He said, and did he not, in Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Let it sink in. Let our, let's marinate our souls in this this morning. The Son of God who is with us, who is with us to the very end of the age, as he said to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, this is the one who loves us with an everlasting love. This is the one who has said that whoever touches us touches the apple of his eye. That's how precious that we are to him. That's how zealous he is for our well-being. And this is the one who in the prophecy of Zephaniah tells us that he rejoices with us, over us, and that he sings over us with loud singing. Now tell me this morning, brethren and sisters, if such a one is standing on our right hand, do we need to be anxious? This is the person. This is the Lord. But we want to think not only about the person, but think of the proximity. The Lord is, is near. Now we can again, as I say, give intellectual assent to that. Yeah, the Bible has said that. Jesus has said that. The apostles have reminded us of that. But isn't it true, I can speak for myself and I'm sure for you also, isn't it true that we often question that because we don't feel, F-E-E-L, his nearness. We don't feel that the Lord is near. And because we don't feel, his, feel that he's near, we conclude that he isn't near. We believe the testimony of our senses rather than the truth. Of his own promise. And what is more reliable? How you feel? Or what he has said? What is the more firm foundation upon which to base our confidence? The unstable testimony of our inward emotions. Or the unshakable and unchangeable truth of that which he has declared to us in his word. Now I'm sure that. It may have seemed to someone like Joseph in the Old Testament scriptures that the Lord wasn't near to him. Son of Jacob, favorite son of Jacob, granted the coat of many colors, hated by his brethren, cast into the pit, sold as a slave into Egypt, bought by Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of attempted rape, thrown into the prison wrongfully on that account. It must have seemed to Joseph at times that the Lord was not near to him. But when you read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, this is a testimony that you'll read like a refrain that comes over and over again, that when he came into the house of Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, it says this very clearly, the Lord was with Joseph. And when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him as she did, 
And you can imagine the shame and the embarrassment of being accused and convicted and punished for a crime such as that when you knew you were perfectly innocent. And he is thrown into prison as a sex offender. And when he's in prison, you know what it says? And the Lord was with Joseph. You come across to the New Testament and Stephen is preaching and making his defense and he alludes to the story of Joseph and he can't get away from this fact that either and he says, but God was with him. It might not have appeared to that if we were to judge by his circumstances. It might not have been appeared to Joseph like that if he were to judge by his, his feelings. But the fact remains it was the truth. The Lord was with him. Sometimes we actually believe in contradiction, in, the, in contradiction to his own express promises that he has forsaken us. Have you ever been at that point in your Christian life when you feel the Lord has forsaken you? When you believe the Lord has forsaken you? I have. Be honest. I find comfort in the fact that that's how the often inspired writers of Scripture felt as well. We think of those words, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They were spoken by the Savior from the cross, and with him they were true. God did forsake him. <coughs> But the reality also is that when those words were first put in Scripture, they were written by David the psalmist. And they were written by him at a time when he believed and wrongfully believed that the Lord had forsaken him. So the belief that the Lord has forsaken us is something too that haunts us and adds to our anxiety and robs us of our peace. But friends, this morning it is a complete falsehood. It is a lie of the devil to drive us into despondency and despair. He has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. Never. We feel that we are on our own with our circumstances. We cannot control those circumstances, and those circumstances can only result in our hurt. This was certainly the case of, with Elisha's servant. You remember the story of the prophet Elisha, who succeeded the great Elijah. He was able, by revelation from God, to tell the king of Israel where the king of Syria's forces were going to be. And, and so the king of Syria finds this out, and he sends out to arrest God's servant Elisha. He finds him in the little city of Dothan and he encompasses the city with all of his hosts. And in the morning Elisha's servant gets up onto the roof of the house and he looks out and he sees the Syrian army surrounding the city. And he cries out in fear, Alas, master, what shall we do? Do you remember Elisha's response? How he exhorted his young servant that those that were with them were more than those who were against them. And then he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of this young man that he might see. And we read that the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw the chariots and the horses of God's army around about Elisha. The Lord was there. The Lord was near. You see, the difference between the two men was this. Elisha, Elisha could see what the young man could see. He could see the Syrian forces there as well. Why was it that he was calm and his servant was terrified? Because he could see what his servant couldn't see. He could see the Lord's presence. Brothers and sisters, let's notice that the Lord is near to us, whether we recognize his nearness or not. But it is when we recognize his nearness that everything changes. I want to end, I've talked about the person who is near to us, the proximity of what it means for him to be near. But I just want to add one final thought. That there are periods in our lives when the Lord would want to especially assure us of his nearness. 
There are times and there are circumstances that, that cause this anxiety in our hearts. And it is in those very circumstances that the Lord wants us to know. Because he knows how our minds work and our hearts work. He wants us to know that he is near. In Psalm 91, the Lord promised to his servant, I will be with him. I will be with him in trouble. You ask yourself the question this morning, what kind of trouble? Well, it doesn't actually say. He doesn't get to specific or, or particular. And I'm glad he doesn't because it covers any kind of trouble. Anything that would cause the mind to be disturbed or in turmoil, anything that would cause anxiety within our souls, a health issue, a financial issue, a family issue, Issues to regarding the state of the church or the state of the country. It could be a million and a one things. But as we look out, we see trouble and written in capital letters. And it's especially then that the Lord would say to you and say to me, I will be with you in trouble. When Moses was being called of God, to go as his ambassador to stand before Pharaoh to lead the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And this is a text of scripture that the Lord used in my own life at a time when he was calling me to, to, to serve him. And you remember how that, how that uh, in effect Moses argued with the Lord and in effect said to him, Lord, you've got the wrong guy. Uh, I'm not eloquent. Nobody will believe me. Send my brother Aaron, all that kind of thing. And the Lord, of course, did not minimize the difficulty of Moses' task from a human perspective. He told them up ahead of time, look, Pharaoh will not believe And as Moses urges the Lord to send someone else, and this was the promise that gripped my heart, the time the Lord called me was this. The Lord said to him, certainly, I will be with you. I will be with you. It's not going to be easy, Moses. <laughs> You're going to find that Pharaoh's heart is going to get harder and harder. You're going to find that your own people are going to lose confidence in you. You're going to find at times that you wonder what you're doing there at all. But I want you to remember this above everything else, Moses. I will be with you. Certainly, I will be with you. It was the same with Joshua when he took over from Moses, the first chapter of the book that bears his name. He's now the commander of the host of Israel. He's going to lead Israel into the land of promise. And the Lord, before he takes up that leadership, says this to him. And, and, and what, a, what a great confidence it was for Joshua to be able to go back to that again and again. In the midst of all of the wars that were to be fought and all the blood that was to be shed before Israel became the inheritance of the nation of Israel. The Lord comes to him and he says, listen, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And so, brothers and sisters, when, and especially when, there are difficult times, when there are troublesome times, when there are times when our hearts are prone to feel the weight of darkness descending upon them. It is in times like that that the Lord would have us to especially remember, I am near. I'm at your right hand. I haven't abandoned you and I'm not going to forsake you. This comes across and I'll end this with this this morning. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. And verse... 17. It says this when the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst. Doesn't that sound like a, a time of trouble? It says, I, the Lord, will answer. I, the God of Israel, listen, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Are there times in our lives when it seems everything has gone dry and arid and barren? It's like a desert. And we're seeking water, as it were, water to refresh our souls, and we can't find it. At that time, 
The Bible says, the Lord says, I, the God of Israel, will not forsake you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Chapter 42, verse 16. I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths they have not known, I will guide, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. And then the familiar words of Isaiah 43. How often have they been read? How often have they been quoted to a child of God who's going through deep, deep waters of affliction or sorrow? But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name, you are mine. When, notice the word, not if, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire you will not be burned. And the flame will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Notice in all these texts in Isaiah, the Lord again is saying, I'll be with you, I won't forsake you. And these are times of trouble and times of sorrow and times of trial. And before we therefore get to this command of the Lord, do not be anxious about anything. Let's grip a hold of this bridge and remember that the Lord is near. Because he is near, we do not need to be anxious about anything. Praise his name.